Yep. Let me give you the floor. Thank you, Frank, for the nice remarks. Let me make sure I understand how to use this thing. Yep. Um, good. Good morning. What, so as Frank said, I wrote the uh, AEA presidential address uh, and presented it last December. It was a fairly abstract discussion of the uh, optimality of fiscal policy in an environment of low interest rates. And what I've done since is uh, tailor the conclusions to various parts of the world, uh, thinking about how this applied to Japan, how this applied to the US, how this applied to the Euro, and going around the world uh, pontificating and proselytizing uh, to try to convince uh, you and policymakers uh, that they should change uh, their ways, or at least think about it uh, in a different way. So this is uh, an attempt to uh, apply what I concluded to the EU fiscal framework, and that's what I'm going to try to do for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Okay. So again, it's always useful to start with a slide which states everything that you want to say before the chair tells you that time is up. Uh, so, the uh, first two points is really just a restatement of what I had uh, said uh, at the AEA meetings in last, last January. The first one is interest rate rates. Interest rates are going to be low, low for a long time. I think the idea that tomorrow morning they'll start increasing is probably something that uh, we should give up and think that there is really a regime change. It may not be forever, it's unlikely to be forever, but it's there for long enough that we have to think about how we behave in that environment. The second is the implications for fiscal policy applied to any EU member, any country on its own. And there are two aspects to it. The first is uh, low interest rates imply uh, smaller costs of debt. That's nearly an arithmetic conclusion, if nothing else. Uh, but at the same time, and that's a separate argument, uh, because they put such limits on what monetary policy can do, and I was here uh, in the last uh, day when this was discussed at some length, uh, there is a need for fiscal policy to do more. So there are both larger uh, stabilization benefits of fiscal policy and smaller costs. That by itself implies that we should think about fiscal policy differently. Now, when you come to implications for EU-level rules as opposed to rules or modes of behavior right, the, the individual uh, country, uh, the only reason why we should have EU-level rules, namely supranational rules, is the existence of externalities. Otherwise, there is absolutely no reason uh, to interfere in what various governments think is best for them. You can only intervene if you think that what they do is going to create risks uh, for the other countries, and that becomes relevant. So that's a way in which the EU-level rules should be thought of or assessed with a different criteria from uh, national rules. And here, what I argue, I, actually I should have said, this is a paper uh, with uh, Jerome Zettelmeyer and Alvaro Leandro, uh, what we argue is that the main externalities that were in the mind of the people who designed the EU level rules were debt externalities. That basically a country going bankrupt would be unpleasant for itself, obviously, but would be unpleasant for the others as well, and therefore had to be prevented. And if you think about most of the rules which were put in place, they really were based on this idea. What we argue is, yes, it's still there, although it's much less likely uh, to be a risk for the reasons that I already mentioned. Uh, but there is now something which was always there but is more Im important, which is demand externalities, which is that in a world in which fiscal policy is really the only tool remaining, it may actually not be used enough because each country is going to see a leakage from what it spends to the other countries and as a result may not want to do uh, what is needed. And I argue that that's relevant 
uh, in a context in which the ECB uh, cannot uh, use monetary policy anymore. Then <coughs> the last part of the talk is propose three reforms. And I think I would have no problem convincing you that the goals are the right ones. And then the question, which I think many of us are struggling with, is uh, what are the remedies? And we offer uh, three dimensions of reform. The first one is how to deal with demand externalities, namely the case where national fiscal policies are just not enough on their own and what needs to be done. The second, which is based on the dramatic decrease in public investment in the EU uh, at the time at which most of us think that actually there should be larger public investment, is to introduce some kind of capital expensing. And I think that the golden rule accounting uh, is a way to go. It's not the only way, but I think it can work, and I'll come back to this. And then the last one, which is surely the most uh, controversial one, is that the problem with the rules is not only that they are not right in the current environment, but we are in an environment in which strict rules are unlikely to be right. The environment is so complex that basically designing ex ante the state of contingencies that it is going to react to uh, is just too hard. And we argue for a shift from rules, the existing system, to standards. Standards don't have numbers. And then there are all kinds of issues about how you do this and how you enforce it ex, ex post. But it turns out that this is not an issue which is specific to this particular uh, issue. It is an issue which has been discussed in the legal literature for a long time. And in many cases, lawyers have, ad have advised uh, to use standards rather than rules. And I think that's a discussion we should have of how realistically, I'm not terribly optimistic, that we'll give up the numbers uh, that we have at this stage. We may change them, but I don't think we'll give numbers. Anyway, so let me just, uh, for those of us who want to know where it's going, there are about 20 slides, I think 19, uh, of which 10 are kind of simple exposition of what I have already said, and then 10 are really applied uh, to the EU issues uh, specifically. So the first point is interest rates. And I've been struck in my discussions with policymakers with the idea that, oh, interest rates are low, but we cannot count on this. They could just turn around tomorrow and then everything you've said becomes irrelevant. And I think that's wrong. I mean, we're never sure. Surely they may go up. They will probably go up one day again. But I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that this is really a low-frequency, lasting movement. Uh, this looks back. It constructs the real interest rate for the uh, uh, Eurozone uh, back, reconstructed before it existed. Uh, and the growth rate. The blue line is the real interest rate, the red line is the growth rate. And as you can see, the steady decrease in the real interest rate, which since the mid 80s, fairly steady. Uh, and the fact that growth is a bit lower, but uh, now is substantially above uh, the uh, interest rate and expected uh, to be so. So on the expectations, again, these must be uh, familiar um, graphs, at least the top one, the yield curves are incredibly low. I mean, in many cases, the rates are at zero or below zero at long maturities, which means that even if you worry about risk in your government, you can borrow at a negative rate or at a zero rate at long maturity. And then if the interest rate goes up during that time, you basically hedged. So it's clear that the markets are fairly confident that rates will remain uh, very low. At, even at very long maturities, you can go a bit deeper and look at the option prices um, and then look at the implied probabilities that markets give to increases in interest rates. And overall, this may be too small to actually uh, read. Uh, and this is now, I think, a month old. Uh, you can see, for example, that the probability that the market put on the three-month LIBOR rate being above 3%, which would still probably be less than the nominal growth rate in five years, is 1%. So it's clear that not only is the mean, which is the yield curve, telling us, yes, markets believe, but 
they actually are fairly strong in their beliefs if you think about uh, what their, the positions that they are taking. So, conclusion is, again, I'm surely not going to argue that rates will be low and lower than go forever. Surely not. I would even bet against that. Uh, but I think we have to take this as the most likely outcome for a long time to come. So, let me turn to fiscal policy implications. And here I'm going to distinguish between what I call pure public finance and functional finance. Pure public finance is the kind of public finance in which you ignore macro. You ignore nominal rigidities and you just say, okay, from a pure public finance point of view, what is it that we should do? And uh, there are four implications, I think, of, of low interest rates uh, for, from the point of view of pure public finance. And then the next one, functional public finance, is the idea that public finance affects macro, which is indeed the case and is important. But let's leave this aside. So, here I'm going to go through steps that those of you who have either read my paper or looked at the arithmetic of debt dynamics uh, all know, but I think they're still worth uh, saying. The first one is lower fiscal cost of debt. Uh, that, you know, is nearly by definition. If interest rate is lower, the fiscal cost is lower. Now, it takes an extreme form when R is less than G, uh, the rate on, on, on debt is less than the nominal uh, growth rate. Then you get these paradoxes, which is that you can actually decrease taxes today, and you do not need to increase them ever after. Or in terms of primary uh, balance, you can have a primary deficit today and never repay it back. Basically, never generate a primary surplus later. And for those of us who have gone through equation with R greater than G, it comes as a surprise, but that's what arithmetic uh, is good for. Uh, it is clearly an extreme case, uh, and again, it may well be that one day R will be greater than G, but it says that the trade-off is fairly, is fairly appealing in terms of taxation, in terms of the burden of taxation. I think the more general point, uh, when you talk to an audience who doesn't understand the uh, uh, algebra, is just to say low cost of debt, and that's very, very relevant, and uh, the point worth making. <coughs> Lower fiscal risk, so cost is cost in terms of uh, taxation, increased taxation in the future. Risk is something different. It's a probability that the level of debt becomes so high that the primary surplus, which is needed to keep the debt to GDP ratio, is politically infeasible, which is typically the way in which this crisis happen. And what you get here is, again, if R is less than G, and again, that's an extreme case, then there cannot be a debt explosion. Basically, you can run any level of primary deficit forever, and debt will not explode. So you never have a need for a primary surplus later. Again, that's arithmetic. It's not deep, but it's still uh, surprising to some. Debt will increase, but it will not explode. And there is indeed a level of a primary deficit which you can maintain forever and still have a constant debt to GDP ratio. So if R is less than G, you do not need to generate a primary surplus. If you think primary surpluses are the source of danger, uh, of political problems, uh, then the danger is, is much, much less. Again, R will one day be greater than G with some probability, and therefore we should be careful. Okay. Now, there is one caveat to it, which is suppose that I was so incredibly successful in my talks that uh, government just went ahead and increased debt. It is still the case that an increase in debt will increase the equilibrium rate. And so at some stage, if you keep pushing, basically R will be greater than G, and then the arithmetic goes the other way. Right. So this is not an unconditional statement, but it says you have quite a bit of room. The third point is, I think, the point which for economists is the most important one, and we care about you know, the finances of a state, but we care about welfare. And there, and this was really the motivation for the paper uh, that I gave at the, AA, at the AA meetings, is, well, the government could issue that, but is it good? And you know, there's this old discussion about dynamic inefficiency, which says compare R and G, and if R is less than G, then actually that is good, because that's an environment in which there is too much capital, it's unproductive, 
And therefore, that is actually good. Now, we used to think of this as just a theoretical case and dismiss it. But we are now in an environment in which the safe air are, is less than G. And so the question is, well, is it the case that actually, uh, you know, the cost of that, the welfare cost of that, uh, is really positive or indeed more that would be good? Well, it turns out that the right way to think about this is to realize that the safe rate is the risk-adjusted rate of return on risky stuff, on the rate of return on capital. And therefore, that's indeed what matters for welfare. Right? From a welfare point of view, you want to adjust for the risk. And I showed that it was a bit more complicated than that, but the, the simple bottom line is when R, the safe rate, is less than G, it could be that actually more debt would be good. That actually, even from a welfare point of view, uh, 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 more debt which squeezes our capital is still worth pushing. Now, I had a political decision to make at that point, which is, was I going to go out saying that is great for growth? Uh, and I decided that I could sell it. And so the way I've said it is that is bad, but not so bad. I just played it that way. And if you use it for the right things, then it's worth it. But if you actually sit down with them all, you may come to the conclusion that with the best parameters you can put in, I say you calibrate it at the SGE, uh, you would actually conclude that because we basically the, sa the safe rate is so low, the risk-adjusted rate of ca uh, for return on capital is actually very low, and having a bit less capital, which is what that does, displaces capital, is actually a good thing. And not pushing it, but more for political reasons. <laughs> than for uh, deep, deep, uh, deep uh, academic reasons. So then there's a fourth aspect of it, which is very relevant, which is that unless you think that the uh, risk-adjusted social rate of return on, uh, on public capital has decreased in line with risk-adjusted rate of return on private capital, then clearly we should have more public investment. And basically, we have a decrease in the cost of borrowing. And if the risk adjusted social rate of return on public investment has not decreased, it makes sense to have more of it. Now, given this, if you look at the data, then one of the main results of fiscal austerity is basically that you know, it has taken place where the short-term costs are limited, namely in public investment. And that graph shows you how much public investment has decreased. And that clearly in the light of what we think should be larger public investment, namely due to global warming, uh, is, is a major issue. So I think these are uncontroversial uh, conclusions for fiscal policy from a pure public finance point of view. Now, functional finance is, a, is I think, a, a term which was introduced by Abba Lerner uh, to indicate that fiscal policy should be used for macro purposes. Okay. If you reintroduce nominal rigidities, all right, uh, and then policy affects aggregate demand and therefore affects output, uh, suppose you have a negative output gap, should you use much weight of fiscal policy? And I think the answer is, well, in our models, and I think in reality, much weight policy is the right tool. Uh, if nominal rigidities is the distortion, then monetary policy in our models is literally the right tool. It can be used more quickly, more nimbly. Uh, it is uh, less political. It's great. But we have gotten to a point where uh, there are limits on what monetary policy can do. Now, that again is a statement about the zero law bound on nominal rates, but in the presence of low expected inflation, low real rates and low nominal rates come together. And what we've seen is monetary policy is constrained. So if monetary policy is constrained, maybe not absolutely constrained, but can only do things at the margin, which is what I believe at this point, then you have to think about fiscal policy as the main stabilization tool. We've seen it's less costly. Uh, it is actually more useful in this case because nobody else can do it. Um, okay. So, I want to show you what this leads to, and that's, I think, the last slide on the non-EU-specific part of the talk. 
Okay. I want to, you to think about the effect of uh, fiscal consolidation of 1% of GDP for the Eurozone as a whole. And I want you to think of the ECB as being at the effective lower bound, ELB. So basically unable uh, to decrease the interest rate or to do whatever else it has in its uh, toolbox. Okay. Now, what are going to be the effects? The effect on output is going to depend on the multiplier. And this is a fairly intense discussion, so I'm going to take a number which I think is in the range, which is one, right? So this is going to lead to a 1% decrease, uh, did I say? I said increase in output, but it actually is a decrease in output. Sorry about the typo. I wish it were, but it's not. Uh, it would be nice uh, if it led to an increase. Maybe Alberto Alesina would have said increase, but I, I, would, I, I would say decrease. So it decreases uh, output by 1%. And what is, what, it, what is the effect it has on the debt? Well, it, it reduces the debt, but less than one for one, because you have this automatic stabilizer coming in. Uh, so the ratio of the deficit uh, is decreased uh, to GDP, is decreased by about 0.7 percent. The stabilizers are more or less 0.3 percent. So, what is the effect of these measures on the debt to GDP ratio? Well, that's going to depend on the initial debt ratio. And the simple arithmetic is given that little d is a debt to GDP ratio. So, the change in, in, it, in it is the rate of change of debt minus the rate of change of output which we can rewrite in the way I rewrite in the next step, and then I give you the formula at the end. The conclusion is, if you start from debt at 100%, which is the case for many European uh, Euro countries, then the debt ratio will actually go down, uh, not up, uh, because basically the effect on output uh, will uh, uh, will will be offset uh, by the effect on debt. And so debt will go down by minus 0.3%. If that is 50%, then you'll get an increase in debt of 0.4% of itself. Right? So the point is not that it, one is plus and the other is minus. It's just that the effect of fairly substantial fiscal consolidation on output, a decrease in output of 1%, will have political implications, lead to extremely small movements in debt, either one way or the other, and it's ambiguous which way it goes. Uh, and it's probably not worth it at this point. I mean, think about the size of the output gaps that you'd have to do in order to decrease the debt from 100% to 60%, say the Maastricht number. Uh, so the point is not that we should never be done, but in an environment in which monetary policy cannot help, fiscal consolidation is extremely costly in terms of output, in terms of how much it delivers in terms of debt to GDP reduction. And so it should not be done now. It should be done, and it's not essential that it be done now for the reasons I've given. Uh, it can be done only when the ECB will have, again, the space to help offset some of this adverse effect of fiscal consolidation. Um, and that's not now. <clears throat> so let me now move to the second half, which is the more relevant one here, uh, about the implications for the EU uh, fiscal framework. Okay. So the first question is, why should there be an EU fiscal framework? Uh, you know, we don't ask that, uh, I mean, countries should be free to do whatever they want in terms of the composition of their budget and their choice, their intertemporal choices, uh, intergenerational choices. We may have views but I don't think that the EU should impose these views on that. It should probably come in only to the extent that what a country does is going to affect other countries for externalities. Okay. So what are the two externalities which matter? The first one is debt externalities, and these are the ones which have shaped the existing rules. Uh, there was a worry that if a country went bust, uh, there would be spillovers from default, and we had plenty of worries about this during the crisis, which is what if uh, a country was to default, what would happen to banks in other countries, and what would be the effect on the financial system, and so on. And there was another one, which I think turned out not to be terribly relevant, 
which was fiscal dominance of the ECB, that uh, basically if countries were starting to uh, have very large debt, they would put pressure on the ECB to monetize it. I think that one hasn't turned out to be very relevant. Uh, but the first one is clearly potentially relevant, which is if a country uh, were to default, uh, then uh, it would have an effect on other countries. Now, the point is, a very simple point, is that these debt externalities, if the event takes place, can be quite bad, but the probability that the event takes place is much lower in an environment of low rates, as I've, shared, as I've shown. Basically, the risks uh, associated with debt are much less now than they were when the interest rates uh, were higher. So it's clear that whatever numbers we came up with, or people came up with then, uh, cannot be the right numbers. The other is demand externalities. And you have all kinds of interactions between countries uh, in a common currency union. But one of them is that some of the demand, if you want to have an increase in, uh, in, in demand, and you use your usual tools, and you can now do uh, home bias to the extent that it was done uh, uh, in, the previous, in the previous papers, then kind of a lot of the demand is going to fall on foreign goods. I mean, when Luxembourg decides that it has an unemployment problem and it increased spending, it's going to help Belgium and France. It's basically not going to do much to Luxembourg. So the optimal thing for Luxembourg is not to do too much. That's true of all countries. So there is these externalities that are going to lead countries not to want to do uh, enough from an EU global point of view. In normal times, that's not a big issue because even if there's insufficient fiscal um, expansion as a result of this, the ECB can come in and just use monetary policy to basically fill the output gap. But if the ECB cannot, then you can have a situation in which you have all the countries having an output gap, none of them being willing to do quite enough to fill it, and in this case you need some coordination device, you need something. Now, again, that sounds very exotic if you go back 10 years ago, people have said yes, it could happen. But it is not at all inconceivable uh, that we are and we will be uh, in a situation like that. So these are the issues. So when you think about EU rules, you have to think externalities and what they imply. <clears throat> this is the highlight of the, of the talk. Uh, it, come from, it comes from Alvaro, uh, uh, who had this marvelous idea of comparing uh, the fiscal rules as they have developed uh, over the years since Maastricht uh, to today, uh, to the Cathedral Seville. It's basically an aggregation of stuff, and uh, great logic is gone. I, it's still a very beautiful cathedral if you have been there, but, <laughs> but, but as giving a sense of coherence, uh, uh, it, it doesn't totally succeed. I don't know if this is a, the best analogy, but it, I, you know, we, lo we love, we love the, the picture, so we've kept it. Uh, in the paper, we have, uh, uh, we've tried to understand all the rules and explain them. I'm not going to do that, but uh, there have been extremely many criticisms of the rules and the complexity of the rules, and are really incredibly complex. Um, it makes filling forms on the internet look like uh, child's play. Uh, the fuzziness of enforcement, the, um, we want to go beyond that. And we agree with many of these things, but we want to go beyond that. So the three points that to us characterize the uh, existing rules. The first one is the main focus is on debt externalities. Basically, I mean, this is clearly where the 60% and the 3% came from. It didn't come from worrying very much about stabilization. It came about, okay, let's make sure that they don't have too much debt, right? In an environment which is not the one we are in today and was probably already uh, much too restrictive a set of rules. The second is the common treatment, largely common treatment of current and capital spending. Now, there are exceptions to this, and if you read the footnotes and all that, there are circumstances in which you're allowed to do a bit more capital spending while satisfying the rules, but the restrictions are such that basically it's irrelevant. I mean, I think it's more a nod to the need rather than uh, accommodation of the need. And then 
The third is that it is set as a set of rules, quantitative rules, with specific numbers uh, for the targets, for the speed of, speeds of adjustment in the uh, uh, MO, uh, MOT uh, medium terms. What is it? MOT medium oyster? Okay, objective. Um, and it's clear that even if it were right, which I would not argue, it is surely not right today. So we want to go back to that. So this is what the rest of the talk is about. Okay, and this is, again, a bit repetitive, but this is what we, f we push. We need to rethink the trade-off between debt and domain externalities. Debt externalities are less important. Domain externalities are more important. We need some way of protecting public investment. And here we push for the golden rule, but the golden rule has two parts. Uh, it basically is a set of accounting rules which separates current spending from capital spending. Uh, this we buy. This we think is useful. We know the limits. It has been discussed many times. Uh, it goes beyond that. And for example, the golden rule is sometimes stated as saying that you have to balance the current account and you can issue debt to finance the capital account. We don't buy that. We think that actually this is not right. Uh, and this could be very dangerous, and I'll come back to this. And then the shift from rules uh, to standards, uh, which I've mentioned, uh, which I'll uh, come back to. And the main reason is we're dealing with an incredibly complex problem to solve, and thinking that we can write down the right contingencies, both for this environment and the next, uh, is just uh, an illusion, and we should not do that. Okay. <coughs> so I want to start with this, uh, which is how, how should we think about the change in the relevance of the externalities. I think the first thing to say is that exter the externalities are not smaller if they happen, or then maybe with regulation, maybe you know, if we can reduce the, the doom loops and other things like this, they would. But the probability that they happen is much smaller. And so given this, you want to basically leave more leeway to countries to do what's needed for stabilization. So I think the first principle, and maybe even more important than anything else I say, is that the EU rules should do no harm. They should basically allow countries which need to use fiscal policy for stabilization to do it, unless there is a debt externality which is uh, potentially there. Otherwise, uh, they should basically leave the room that countries need. Okay. And it's clear that the current constraints are too strong. Now, separate from that, there's the issue of demand externalities. Okay. So again, more formally, if you have and countries, and they all do what's optimal for them, given what the others do, so it's a Nash equilibrium, you're going to get too little fiscal response. Because again, you're doing some, everybody's doing something for the others, which they put no uh, value uh, on. And so in this case, what you need is coordination, is something. Okay. Here, it's a very old discussion, uh, which was largely based on risk sharing and the notion that sometimes countries need to be helped. The argument here is, is different. Basically, think of a case in which all countries have a negative output gap. It is better for them to actually meet and all do stronger fiscal. There is no risk sharing involved. It is basically a way of achieving a higher level of output by coordination. And the reason they are willing to do this is that they know that if they do it, the others will do it and it will compensate. So it is another argument for having a central EU facility uh, the success of pushing this on the grounds of risk sharing have gone nowhere. And I'll give a second reason to do it. Maybe it will still go nowhere, but it is clearly the way to go. I think it's, it's, quite, it's quite essential. And basically what this facility should do, if it existed, should be financed by euro bonds, which we know has uh, good, good aspects. Uh, it may face one of two situations. So one is one that my friend and co-author Larry Summers believes may well be the situation in which Europe will be, which is secular stagnation, which is persistently low demand and a persistent need for higher uh, fiscal expansion 
on a very sustained basis because the private demand is just not enough. In this case, the way to respond to this is to have at the EU level some program which basically has uh, a fiscal dimension and can basically increase uh, public investment uh, on a sustained basis. So anything, now here there's a marvelous coincidence, which is the one with uh, global warming and the need for green investment. It's clear that there are externalities also at that margin, that a country doing it alone is not getting the reward. So I think that having the public investment, public green investment at the Brussels level would solve all kinds of issues uh, and would be very much needed uh, if there is secular stagnation. If you believe that, no, it's we're just flirting with the zero law bound, but we're not there all the time. It's still the case that you could have transitory shortfalls and recessions of the old-fashioned old recessions, in which case, if the ECB cannot respond, you again have a problem of coordination. And for this, putting in place a cyclical tool, I've explored, for example, temporary decreases in the VAT, coordinated across countries, is a way to go. But these you need to have. Uh, the risk that uh, you, you find yourself having to, yet to use them and not having them uh, in place is an issue. Okay, so if it doesn't work, well, you know, there can be agreement among the willing and able, but uh, the question is how many of those uh, would come in, and that's clearly not, not ideal. <clears throat> so golden world accounting is, as you know, is basically the idea that there's a capital budget and there's a current account uh, budget, uh, which separates basically what is capital accumulation and not. Now, that what we argue is for the existence of such accounting. Okay. Um, there are all kinds of discussions which we go into the paper at length. I mean, you know, it was considered even by the EU at some point and rejected. There was a commission uh, which rejected it. Much of the issue is what is considered capital spending. And then you get into the usual examples of are the wages of educators capital spending or not, and therefore an increase in wages for uh, capital spenders, for education, edu ed for teachers, uh, capital spending. It's clear that when you start going there, it becomes very fuzzy. Uh, another example that I was given when I gave a talk uh, in Italy is, and you're going to like that, uh, is uh, the decrease in the retirement age, which the previous government had considered. And it was explained to me that this was actually capital spending. And the reason why it was capital spending is that it would get rid of people like me, you know, who, that's just at the end of their life, right? Replace me by somebody young, with much more ability to contribute to growth, and therefore the growth effects would clearly dominate and would help Italy grow at a faster rate. Uh, I'm not absolutely sure that the logic is impeccable, but the political uh, aspect of it uh, uh, makes it a non-starter. So you need, a, you need a commission, you need basically a committee which decides what it is that you can put below the line, and you clearly want to be very restrictive and not allow for crazy stuff, and it has to be done at the EU level. But I think it can be done. Now, on this is really just a side remark, a third point there. I do not agree, or we do not agree, uh, on uh, the golden rule as a normative rule. So the normative rule is, well, current account needs to be balanced, maybe not every year, but over, over a cycle. Uh, uh, and the capital account, yes, you can finance by debt. That would be wrong. Uh, first, if you're in a situation of secular stagnation, then the notion that uh, current account must be balanced becomes a constraint, which is a counterproductive one. You may actually need to have a current account deficit for a long time. If a private sector doesn't do it, who is going to do it? So having a constraint that has to be balanced over three years or whatever, is dangerous. The other is public investment presumably has sufficiently high risk-adjusted social rates of return, but it may have zero financial returns, in which case if you issue debt, right, then what you're going to have to do is basically find the money to pay the interest on the debt. And so the notion that you can fully finance your capital account 
by debt is not responsible if a, a capital account is in projects which have very low financial rates of return. Now, one way out, which has been proposed, is have only projects which have high financial rates of return. But that defeats the purpose. Presumably, the reason we have public investment is that there are projects which have high social rates of return and low or zero financial rates of return. So that's not the way. OK, let me <coughs> move to the last uh, three slides. I don't know how much time I have uh, for. I have two minutes. OK. So I really have to make my case in a tight and convincing way. It's so, standard. No bigger given. Right? It's a standard approach. No uh, yeah, I, 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 you're absolutely right. He said behave, right? Exactly. He didn't say two minutes or anything like that, right? But exposed, he will be allowed to basically decide where I was. Now, uh, OK. The point is, we, we're arguing that we should give up on numbers and that we should move from rules to standards. And we discovered in the process of doing this and interacting with lawyers that this is a very long discussion uh, in the law literature. And it's not a hoax versus doves. I mean, rules is not hoax, doves is not standards. It's not that discussion. It's basically different trade-offs. Right? Rules, you basically ex ante. You say you define the contingencies, you define the escape clauses, then you decide about numbers and adjustment rules and all that. Okay. Standards is say you define principles. You define what an appropriate, unquote, fiscal policy is. The country comes, say this is what we want to do, and you assess that that's acceptable or not. But you're not basically about numbers, you're about something else. And there's an exposed assessment. Now, that's something that you see everywhere. There is an example below in terms of speed limits, you know. Rules would be 55, 55 miles limit, 35 uh, miles if rain, signs that you see. The other would be drive carefully, right? Which would give much more flexibility, but clearly some dangers as well. Now, when would you choose one or the other? I think the answer is when a problem is incredibly complex and you cannot think about the relevant contingencies, then is what I call Knightian uncertainty. It's very, very hard to think about what may happen. Then the case for standards is extremely strong. The case for rules means that if you do it, you'll have to cheat, not respect the rules, pretend you respect them, but uh, destroy their credibility. Okay. And the last point on this slide is that you know, there are plenty of places where standards are the standard, uh, rather than the rules, uh, all antitrust is basically based on standards. There is no such thing as if your firm exceeds X, you know, then you have to do something. It's always considering the market and so on and so on. So <clears throat> the two slides is how it could look like. We tried to make this uh, more, uh, put more flesh. So the EU primary legislation, namely the, the treaty, could have that. Members. A member states shall avoid excessive government deficits. That's unchanged, that's fair. When the European Commission deems a deficit to be excessive, member states shall reduce it at a speed which minimizes harm to their prosperity and those of the member states. It would replace the numbers which are there by a statement like this. Then there would be a secondary legislation and more work. Basically, it would say a member state is not excessive if a debt sustainability analysis indicates that debt is sustainable with high probability. Okay. In determining the speed of adjustment, if the need, if the need is, is there, member states shall take into account the probability with which debt is unsustainable, market conditions, state of, the state of the economic cycle of your member state, and so on. And this could be backed by uh, a tool that I actually love and have pushed for at the fund, is stochastic DSAs which is basically you know, looking at all possibilities, being very generous about the distributions. What's the priority that deck will go berserk? And that's what I think it should be based on. The last slide before the conclusion. This is a big issue. And this is you know, where I basically get, we get attacked, and rightly so, which is how do you enforce standards? I mean, how you enforce rules is not obvious. I mean, the history of the, of the rules is not a very pleasant one. And, they have been cheating right and left. But 
it seems even more relevant for standards. So we propose two options. The first one is just a tougher approach, a tougher version of the current approach. So the, the states state what they want to do, okay, and basically they show. Then the commission looks and says, no, it's not in the spirit of the standards. We don't think it's acceptable. It asks for revisions. If a member state doesn't comply, then the Council of the uh, European Union adjudicates. So this has a combination of technocrats playing a role and the uh, political uh, body uh, coming to an end. Uh, the other one is to have an independent body as an adjudicator. So it could be the uh, European Court of Justice, which would have to be expanded to have people who know something about fiscal policy, which they don't. Or it could be the uh, European Fiscal Board, which looks like a perfectly good institution to build on, has done extremely good work and could be done. Then if there was, uh, uh, and then this would leave it out of the European Council, of the politicians, and would develop a jurisprudence. What you learn from reading the law literature is that a lot of that leads to the building up of principles based on jurisprudence. And so you need you know, a core of lawyers to actually get there. So we think it's worth discussing, even if it, not, if it will never happen, but it's important. And these are the conclusions, which just repeat. Interest, don't assume interest rates are going, to go, are going to increase soon. You need to reassess fiscal policy deeply. You need to reassess the EU fiscal framework deeply. To quote one of our European leaders, who didn't say that, but should have said that, prudence is to change, not to keep. Uh, short run, I see a danger. I think that the risk has come down a little bit. If there is a big recession at the European level, you basically, under the existing rules, do not have the tools you need. Um, and then the last point is, what should we be thinking about? I think public investment, global warming is, um, should be on the agenda. It is increasingly on the agenda. And then the right short-term uh, tool with coordination, which I think is a VAT a rate temporary decrease. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh about 10 minutes for Q&A, so I'll collect a few questions. Kistov. Um, thank you, Olivier, for this very inspiring talk and, and for drawing lessons for the European debate. I would have uh, three comments questions. The first one is uh, when you talk about standards versus rules, also the idea to um, downgrade the importance of numbers. I'm just wondering when we think about monetary and fiscal policy, when it is about framing of public debate or anchoring expectations, as we call it in central bank jargon, uh, there is a lot of attention being put to simple numbers like 2% for the ECB or close to, but uh, below but close to, and as um, Benoit yesterday said, there may be merit even in being simpler and focusing on just one number. We know that the 3% Maastricht deficit reference level has a lot of importance in a lot of countries, even though it's not a target. But so I'm just wondering whether giving up numbers altogether would not complicate uh, the communication with the broader public. The second point would be on the EU antitrust analogy. I think one thing we are struggling about, it's not so much the distinction between standards and rules, but where's actually sovereignty? And also President Draghi made that point very often that there is this trade-off between institutions and rules and where sovereignty is placed. Fiscal policy is a matter of national sovereignty and probably we cannot get around that. As you said, having a strong fiscal capacity would be a first best, but we're not going there right now. So we need to do the best out of the rules. Last point on your Article 126 proposal. I'm a bit surprised that it's only about uh, what to do when deficits are ex uh, excessive. I thought your, your lecture was a lot about the symmetry of approaches, so also what to do 
when there is too little support from countries where everyone would agree that there is enough space to act and so there would be no obligation to act and that's one of the things that have been debated a lot. Thank you. Maybe it's better. Yeah, these were three questions, right? <laughs> Uh, these were three extremely good questions in the sense that these are questions that we've asked ourselves uh, along the way. So on the standards versus rules, I agree that numbers sometimes are helpful. Uh, I suspect, for example, that at the beginning of the euro, credibility was a very big issue and therefore having numbers, uh, a 60% number, right or wrong, kind of focus the mind. So I think there's a sense in which at the beginning, you know, this is the same thing when you do disinflation. So you actually want to kind of link yourself to numbers or simple rules for credibility reasons. And there was a lot of questions as to whether there, there would be responsible, responsible policies. I think to a large extent, when the credibility has been achieved, largely achieved, then you can move to something smoother less constraining. Uh, to take examples again from these inflation episodes, you may want to fix the exchange rate, but if you fix it for too long, you get Argentina. Right? So there are, basically, I think in all these cases, there's a transition period in which you may want to rely on the explicit guide, guidelines. Once you think you're closer to a steady state, you may want to be more relaxed. The other remark is, I hate the Taylor rule for monetary policy. Uh, but I accept it because of the nature of monetary policy and the political, of the apolitical, largely apolitical aspect of monetary policy. In the case of fiscal policy, I'm very worried about the complexity of fiscal policy relative to monetary policy and the notion that John has pushed of a simple fiscal rule strikes me as having more type 2 risks than type 1. And so I'm not for it. But, but you've raised a very good point, which is, yes, uh, these are anchors. I mean, numbers are anchors. And if there are no numbers, then how do people come to... Uh, so I think the 2%, you know, whether it's the right number for inflation, is an anchor for these people to... So I think there's a trade-off. I accept that. Um, on the antitrust, the comparison to antitrust, you're completely right. And <clears throat> this was actually... Uh, I think it was at some, st at some stage in one of the slides and we took it off, is that there is a difference. Although I, one could argue that maybe the difference is not clear, but in the case of fiscal policy, it really looks like the responsibility of a government. And therefore, the ultimate decision should probably be taken by governments in some form. This is the reason for feeling that, although while not competent, having the European Council be there is probably needed Otherwise, it looks like a bunch of technocrats just decided. Uh, there's a risk, which is that, yes, they are representing the will of the people, maybe, but they're highly political and may not agree to the right thing. But that's an issue we already have uh, in many ways. But you're right that there's a difference in antitrust, which is about firms in principle and, and government. And then on the Article 126, it's interesting. I tried to make the slide slightly less busy than uh, my co-author in the pre previous presentation had. And I took one line out, which was in the discussion of how the treaty could be modified. So the primary legislation and the Article 126, he had added something which said, if the ECB is unable to help, it is incumbent upon the countries to actually help with fiscal policy or some. some. And I took it out. But you saw through it. Uh, yeah, it should be there. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Uh, second row, yeah. You, like, you may stand up for the camera. Ah, okay. Uh, I very much liked uh, your um, uh, reclaiming of uh, Abalerna's functional finance, which makes you closer to closer and closer to MMT, and no. uh, um, but no. but also but also to no. but also to Paul Samuelson. Because uh, in the Paul Samuelson's economics, there is a number of statements that, uh, that are considered today MMT about debt. Functional finance has a more extreme um, approach to debt, where debt is just the record of past net spending minus the money that's been used to pay taxes. And, uh, and that, 
in functional in our balloons functional finance is never a target, it's never an objective, it is a residual. And um, now the problem with functional finance is that it can be used and it's been used today to uh, as an argument to reclaim um, monetary sovereignty of individual countries. And so I think there may uh, we should also consider another argument in the tradition of limits to um, fiscal policy. And this is uh, James Buchanan argument, which is really very much political. It's very much about limiting the otherwise unlimited power of politicians to control uh, the, uh, the national currency. And in this sense, I think the, um, um, uh, if we consider uh, the, the, the political economy of, of, of fiscal policy, uh, then um, moving uh, to a, a coordinated fiscal policy, and more or less along the standards that you are suggesting, uh, is politically a way superior uh, approach to country level flexibility, meaning that this leaves uh, much less freedom to um, um, uh, democratically elected governments to use limits, to, to use uh, flexibility to, to, uh, um, uh, to construct uh, political consensus. And um, so in that sense, the political economy of fiscal policy matters in this respect. Okay, I suggest we now collect some questions. So I have uh, Lucio over there. If you can stand up for the camera. I have a question and a comment. The question is on the golden rule. Uh, actually, it's two points. One, at the beginning of your presentation, you argue first that low interest rates may be an indication of uh, low return on cap of marginal problem of capital, if I understand. Then my question is, what leads you to believe that social return may not have gone down in lockstep, at least if one thinks of the difference between public and private capital in terms of appropriability of the return? So this is a bit of a theoretical question. Mm -hmm. um, then on the golden rule, if you allow me, uh, I take your point that you don't take it as normative. Hmm? Still, does not your advocacy for this capital accounting presupposes that the existing set of rules constraint investment? In other words, if politicians were not constrained by, quote, stupid, unquote, rules, they would invest more. I ask you the question because we have carried out some empirical work that doesn't support this intuitively appealing uh, proposition. My final point is a comment on your solution, uh, the political versus the judiciary adjudication system. So my contention, uh, I may be a bit biased there, but at the same time, I have think, considerable experience being one of the architects of, or the artisan of the cathedral of Sevilla, <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that what you have in place now... You, you look very young. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what we have in place now, <laughs> if you strip, okay, many complications and ornaments, comes somehow close to your first model. That is, yes, there are rules, but then they are adapted and things are put to the council, and we have certain outcomes. <laughs> the problem with this, however, is that the council is dealing with different tables. Ah, so to be concrete, uh, you may have come to the conclusion that Italy is on an unsustainable path. Mm? So it would fail your standard. Mm? But still, Italy is important because issue of migration and, I mean, other tables. And you are going to have this problem, I think, even in, in your first, uh, because what you propose in terms of your first solution, in my view, is closer than you may think to what really happening, 
But the real problem with that is not the lack of technical expertise of judgment, is the fact that consideration other than economic ones intrude into the deliberation. And I have a rule. Who will be the judge? <laughs> Rul Beeksma, uh, European Fiscal Board. Thank you very much for your inspiring uh, lecture. Um, one of the, well, as European Fiscal Board, we are obviously, um, you know, we are in support of fiscal rules, um, and uh, we are not um, pleading for, uh, you know, dismissing all the work that uh, Lucio has done. Now, one of the, um, so in our review report that we wrote for the Commission President uh, some months ago, um, we also suggested that, um, you know, maybe going beyond the treaty, one could have a differentiation in debt targets across countries. And someone could maybe have a contract uh, over a seven-year period in which debt targets would be differentiated across countries uh, because of uh, you know, different projections of health care, pension expenditures, maybe also climate-related expenditures, um, which would maybe also make debt targets more, uh, more realistic yeah, because we cannot expect... Italy to reduce its debt to 60% within 10 years, say. So I'm just wondering how you think about, um, you know, differentiated debt targets. So still have debt targets or debt ceilings, differentiated debt ceilings, but, um, um, you, know, you know, tied to the two countries' uh, uh, needs. Thank you. Then maybe last question, Neil? Or, no? So thanks. This was really a great talk. And, you know, I see, so to speak, the fundamental economic points that in an environment of low interest rate, <clears throat> the uh, debt externality may become less relevant, relatively speaking, to the demand externality. But, you know, after all, we are in Europe and here strange things can happen and out of the blue in some countries maybe rates can hike up and then we do have a sustainability problem there. So I wonder in when it comes to reforming the overall architecture, whether you can combine, so to speak, the reform of the fiscal framework with the ongoing reform of the ESM, because after all, the ESM is the institution addressing sustainability concerns, and if as a hedge, as a backstop, we would have there a better procedure to more orderly uh, restruct debt in case of need, this would make room, I think, for having more flexibility to address the demand externality. So I wonder how you see this trade-off. Okay. Olivier, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I got the gist. The rates can increase again, and then whatever rules we've put for this set of rates is going to be obsolete again. I think that's more an argument for having either incredibly complex rules which take into account all the changes in the environment or saying that, you know, basically you don't want to get stuck with a set of rules and that leads you to standards, I think. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, suppose we were to design a system. Suppose I was to totally convincing except on the standards part and I convinced you that now we can have rules and 60 should be, the new 60 should be 120 and the new three should be six and so on, so on. Right? And you all bought that, unlikely, but you would. Okay, and then interest rates increase much more than the growth rate. As long as the two move together, it's not the end of the world. Okay, then we'd be in the opposite situation of having something which is much too loose for the new environment. And so it is that worry that basically the, that the world is changing in very complex ways. Nobody would have thought about the great stagna uh, stagnation you know, until recently. Nobody thought that we would be stuck at zero rates. So this is where principles, standards, I think have a flexibility uh, which dominates any, any set of rules. Uh, so I'm not sure I answered your question, but at least I answered mine. <laughs> uh, uh, so on, uh, on that targets, I mean, this is, you know, this is probably where it will go, which is, I don't think we'll see standards. Uh, we'll see more and more complicated rules, which will be more and more uh, country contingent, uh, state contingent, and so on. 
uh, I'm not sure it will work. I mean, it's clearly progress. Uh, if we really can get to a kind of uh, contingency tree uh, and have a, a good sense of it and write you know, decisions associated with each of the branches of a tree, it's progress. I'm just skeptical that the world is a complex place, the tree will change, uh, and that having principles uh, is, is, is our standards is the way to go. Again, I think that when I was at the phone and working with Vito, actually, the, uh, you know, I, I thought that stochastic debt sustainability analyses were incredibly useful in allowing to think about all the contingencies uh, in a way which would have made it very difficult to say, well, this country is not satisfied with four numbers and therefore is in trouble. So I think we have better tools. I think these tools do not lead to specific numbers. They say the, the tools at best say, well, given what we know about the political system, the initial debt, various characteristics of the political process, the probability that debt is sustainable is at least 98%. Seems to me to be what we can hope for. And then we can decide whether that's accept acceptable or not. Uh, but again, I think what we're going to see is, you know, just uh, uh, the cathedral is going to uh, get another two or three floors uh, on top of it before we're done. Um, on investment, I don't know where the question was, uh, it was here. Yeah, I, if you think that public investment has decreased and that the risk adjusted rate of return, social rate of return on on public investment has decreased with the private one, then you don't want to do. Uh, and same applies to private investment. You don't want to do it. I'm profoundly skeptical, although I've not done a kind of marginal product uh, of capital computations, for two reasons. The first one is it is absolutely obvious, and I think even Vitor will not object if I say that fiscal austerity has come on the back largely of public investment. And this was a political decision, it was an easy decision, but it's unlikely uh, that it was from an economic point of view the right decision. So it, it must be that we killed projects which probably were, were justified. And then again, the, the issue of global warming, of green investment, is going to be you know, much more important than anything we've discussed at this, uh, uh, here today. Uh, it's going to require very large amounts of, of funds. So I'm quite sure that in terms of saving the planet, the marginal return to public investment is fairly high. Uh, but, you know, these are words. Uh, they, sh they should be, they should be um, backed by, by facts. Um, I think there was one more question. Um, thank you for the kind of history uh, of, of, of where all this comes from. Uh, but to be honest, I, I want to stay with what I say and not associate with some of the alternative uh, uh, arguments which have been made. I, for, re for reasons I do not want to go into, I think MMT is b badly, badly thought out uh, and a dangerous thing and sometimes there are allies on your side that you're not totally happy to have. And this is a case of one. Um, the other issue which I think you touched is that of coordination. So I've said the role of EU rules is there is only a role if there are externalities. Well, maybe not. Maybe somebody could have a much more uh, European view of things, much more interventionist, and say, no, no, we basically want to uniform, you know, make more uniform all kinds of dimensions of fiscal policy. May, we may want to have the same generosity of uh, transfer benefits and so on and so on. I took it as not uh, the case, but basically the only reason why there are rules at this point is if you do something which is going to affect me, I want to be able to say something. But again, the integration of Europe may go far beyond that and say, well, we have to do many things the same way. Coordination of many other aspects is probably important. I've left it out. I'm done. Okay, thank you very much, Olivier. Um, I think now is uh, time for lunch, which is just outside, uh, and we will be back at the quarter past one. No? Uh, I can